Here's our next lecture for macroeconomics. We're going to start looking at the money supply. What serves as money in our economy? Um, your text, uh, chapters 14 and 15, go through this. So you need to have something that uh, people will accept for payment. Um, so it's a uh, medium of exchange. And then you need to have something that uh, will be there tomorrow. So it needs to be storable. Um, otherwise, we'd be using ice cream for money. Yum. But it melts. Uh, a unit of account. You need to be able to break it down and add it back up and perform calculations with it. So uh, we have... Today, in our lives, we have uh, paper money and we have electronic money. So the paper money, including the coins, um, you know, are our Federal Reserve notes, the ones and the fives and the tens and the twenties and stuff, and then all the change, the coins. Then the electronic money would be your debit card or when you write a check. Um, you can transfer online pay things. So for example, my paycheck, um, I never see it. It uh, automatically is deposited into my checking account. And then uh, from there, uh, automatically, uh, I have certain bills that get paid um, every month. And uh, anything left over, I can use my debit card to uh, spend. So it's getting to the point where People aren't using cash very much and people are not writing checks very often. If you want to then look at uh, what is backing up our money, what makes our money have value, what makes us confident that it has value, um, the paper money is being used to back up the electronic money. Um, if you go back in the middle of the last century, you actually had gold and silver backing up the paper money, and you didn't have electronic money. And uh, that stopped. And, um, you know, people initially thought, oh, well, how can you not back up the paper money with something like gold or silver? But it worked just fine. And what makes it work just fine is that the control over the paper money supply is in the hands of a, an entity that is very trustworthy. It's called the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States of America. They control how much paper money is in the economy. The printing is actually done by the Treasury, but then the Treasury gives the paper money they've printed to the Federal Reserve, and then the Federal Reserve uh, spends it. They can buy U.S. Treasury securities. Um, in, in hard times like this, uh, they've been giving, given a little more uh, power to buy things like uh, mortgage-backed securities. But most of the time, it's just treasury securities that they buy. Treasury bills, treasury notes, treasury bonds. Okay, so here is a pie chart of how much electronic and how much paper money there is. That's the left-hand pie over here. And you can see that Currency and circulation, that's the paper money and the coins. Uh, 1.457 uh, trillion. Checkable deposit, your checking account is electronic money. So that's 1.96869, uh, rounded to the nearest trillion dollars. Okay. Let me have you look at this. 
first of all. This is one of the files I sent you. It's called Crucial Vocabulary because it's very important. It's crucial. So we're going to start with it. So what the Federal Reserve does is it controls how much paper money there is in the economy and in the world. And then from that, it also controls how much electronic money can be made based on the paper money. That's called a required reserve ratio. So the Fed sets that. Uh, it allows banks to create a multiple of electronic dollars based on every paper dollar they have. So if the bank uh, has a paper dollar in its vault, then they can make something like five or 10 or so uh, electronic dollars based on that. So the amount they can make, the required reserve ratio, depends on the size of the bank and what kind of deposit it is. If it's a uh, savings account, people tend to leave that alone. But if it's a checking account, people tend to dip into that and come and get that. And so uh, the number of electronic dollars you can create off of a savings account dollar is greater than off a checking account dollar because you can't count on having that checking account dollar for very long. People spend their checking accounts. So let's look at what we've got in terms of paper money in the bank. It's called vault cash. Commercial banks are uh, basically credit unions too, as well as the uh, uh, banks that are depository institutions, they take your deposits for checking accounts or savings accounts. Some things are called banks that really shouldn't be. Uh, they're really investment banks. Goldman Sachs, for example, uh, you might remember Lehman Brothers went uh, bankrupt and no longer exists after like 165 years, it's pretty amazing. That happened during the uh, last recession that we went through, during the financial meltdown. Uh, Bear Stearns, Merrill Lynch, they were bought up by other um, investment banks and other commercial banks. So your commercial bank would be Bank of America, uh, Wells Fargo, Chase, um, you know, Bank of Albuquerque, and uh, pretty much the credit unions are, are banks too. Used to not be, but they've... Uh, over the years, uh, been granted the same powers pretty much as uh, regular banks are. So those are commercial banks. So you'd look in their vault and see how much cash they have in there. That would be the vault cash. Then there's another thing that's important. Banks can send their cash to the Federal Reserve and have the Federal Reserve hold on to it. This is called a um, deposit at the Fed. I abbreviate it with DEPF. So deposits of commercial banks at the Fed. Um, only banks can make deposits at the Fed. Uh, it doesn't matter how rich you are. You can't have a checking account at the Fed. Just a bank. Now, you know, if you're rich enough, I guess you could buy a bank and then they could have a checking account at the Fed. It's sort of be yours. So what they do with that is they use those deposits at the Fed to help clear checks. And I'll have to show you what a uh, clearing a check means. Legal reserves, sometimes called actual reserves, same thing. It's the sum of these two things. It's all of the vault cash and all of the deposits at the Fed. So basically that's all the paper money that the bank owns. Uh, the Fed lets you count deposits with them as paper money because all you have to do is, uh, you know, email them, pick up the phone or whatever and ask for your money. And it, you can always get it, get the cash because the Fed is the source of all the cash. They never run out. So they let you uh, count that as cash, as paper money. So that is going to be backing up the electronic money that the banks will create. And we'll see how they create that. So the sum of those two are legal reserves. 
Checking accounts by bank, banks, they call them not checking accounts, they call them demand deposits. That's really a better name because um, they're payable on demand. If you've heard the expression payable on demand, it means payable right now, you can't wait. Uh, that's what checking accounts are. You go to a bank and ask for your money out of your checking account, they cannot make you wait for it. They have to give it to you right away. So payable on demand. Required reserve ratio, this is a percentage. It's set by the Fed. It's the percentage of demand deposits that must be held in the form of legal reserves. So for example, let's say a bank had a billion dollars of checking accounts, they call them demand deposits, okay, a billion dollars. And the required reserve ratio is 10%. Then that bank would have to keep at least 10% of a billion, so that's 100 million, either in their vault or at the, at the Fed or a combination of the two. That's a required reserve. So in real life, they range from around 3% to around 13%. Those reserves, the, the Fed doesn't change them very often, hardly at all. Then uh, required reserves. That's the amount of cash that must be held to back up your electronic dollars. So in the above example, it's the 100 million. So you have to have 100 million in cash, either in your vault or at the Fed or a combination of the two. So your required reserves would be 100 million to back up the 1 billion, that's 1,000 million. Right? So you'd have to have 10% if the required reserve ratio is 10%. If it was 5%, then you wouldn't need so much. You'd need 50 million instead of 100. Excess reserves would be legal reserves minus required reserves. So for example, the bank that we've been talking about with the uh, thousand billion, one trillion of uh, checking account, I'm sorry, one billion of checking account money, and a thousand million, um, that bank could decide to hold a little bit more in cash than just the 100 million that's the minimum. Typically they do that as a safety margin. Assets defined as things owned by the bank or owed to the bank. Liabilities are things that the bank owes to others. So an interesting thing is if you bring in $10 to the bank to put in your checking account, they owe that back to you. It's just that you haven't asked for it yet. So because you haven't asked for it yet, they get to use it. So they own it until you ask for it, then they get to give it back to you right away. So that $10 that you deposit in your checking account is an asset and a liability both at the same time. So it's owned by the bank, but it's owed back to you also. So what we're going to see that bankers do is they will create uh, accounts called balance sheets where um, the assets and the liabilities are shown and they're supposed to balance because they're supposed to be, um, sort, most of it is supposed to be equal. Uh, their deposits and savings or deposits and checking. So they are owned, so they're an asset, but they're also owed back, so they're a liability at the same time. So we're gonna see how that works. And then lastly, uh, the definition of M1. This is the most uh, basic measure of the money supply. Uh, we're gonna use it to get you started understanding monetary policy. M1 is the sum of all the checking accounts in the hands of the non-bank public and cash in the hands of the non-bank public. So a checking account that one bank has with another bank or one bank has with the Fed, that does not count as M1. It's just non-bank entities like you and me or uh, businesses or government entities.